Welcome everybody to the Spiritual Warfare Conference, hosted by the Brotherhood of Penitents of St. Dismas. My name is Tony Acosta, and I want to welcome everybody to uh, this great conference here. Let's begin with the prayer. Nomine Patri, et Filio, et Spiritu Sancto. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus frutus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc tentinora mortis nostre. Amen. Saint Joseph, terror of demons. Our Lady of Guadalupe. All God's angels and all God's saints. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Before we begin this, this spiritual warfare conference, I want to make an invitation to all men here to come and join the Brotherhood of Penitents of St. Dismas here at, at Holy Innocence Catholic Church. We meet every Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And the great thing about the, the Brotherhood of Penitents of St. Dismas is that we have a rule of life. I think every man has had to have a rule of life. And if you look in the back of your itinerary, I listed down the, the rule of life that we follow every week. And just to make it even better, what we do is when we get together on Tuesdays, we get up and we confess what we missed that week. And that's to have accountability. And we have brothers aiming to that same goal and we want accountability and that's what men need. So number one, we attend weekly meetings and functions of the brotherhood. When I say functions, we have every first Friday of the month, we have an all night vigil. Every third Saturday of the month, we pray three rosaries and a divine mercy here at the FPA. It's a couple of miles away from here. Number two, weekly fasting and abstaining from meat every Friday. Number three, praying the rosary every day and praying the St. Dismas prayer daily. Number four, spiritual reading for 15 minutes every day. Number five, we have to spend at least one hour every week in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And the last one, the most important one, all this that we do in the Brotherhood, we don't keep it to ourselves. We bring it to our family. I bring it to my wife and my children. That's part of evangelizing and evangelizing others too when there's an opportunity. So I invite every man here, we meet every Tuesday at 7 p.m. at the Parish Hall at Holy Innocence Catholic Church. Our first talk, let me present Jesse. Jesse is a full-time bilingual Catholic lay evangelist who is nationally acclaimed for his dynamic, upbeat, Christ-centered preaching. His preaching apostolate is one on-fire evangelization. Jesse is a resident of Arizona and a retired Los Angeles deputy of Sheriff, who has been married to his wife, Anita, since 1983, and is parent of three children and grandchildren. He has a BA from Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles and an MA in Catholic Theology from Franciscan University in Steubenville, Ohio. He is bilingual Catholic author, recipient of the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Award, the Fullness of Truth Defender of the Faith Award, and Sports Faith International Award. Jesse has been on the Catholic radio for over 15 years now, hosting, teaching, and speaking in English and Spanish. Currently on the Virgin Most Powerful Radio.org hosting the Terry and Jesse Show and Jesse 911. Jesse is also a host on a Catholic for Catholics apostolate, CFORC.com. With further ado, let me present to you Jesse Romero. Thank you, brother. What was not mentioned, Jesse Romero is also hated by the Catholic left. <laughs> Jesse Romero is being tracked by the FBI. That wasn't mentioned either. Okay, Spiritual Warfare 101. <clears throat> How did we get here? So we can understand, I wanna give you kind of a big picture this morning. And in order for us to really appreciate our Catholic faith or the Lord Jesus Christ, 
it doesn't do me any good to come in here and give you some rah-rah speech about, about uh, the Catholic faith. First, we have to know what went wrong before you get the rah-rah speech. So you're going to hear me this morning. I'm going to talk about problem. Then we're going to move into solution. That's the way you tackle a problem. First, you've got to identify the problem. And then we're going to move into solu in the solutions. So how did we get here? I'm going to hit the rewind button, go back to the very, very beginning. God, who is supernatural, there's nobody in the universe that's supernatural other than God. God the Trinity is a supernatural being in his essence. What does that mean? That means that a supernatural being means he's all-knowing, all-powerful, present everywhere. God had no beginning. God has no end. Everything that exists depends upon God. Plants, trees, fish, whales, lions, giraffes, humans, angels, demons. Everything that exists, it depends upon God for their existence. God is the only being that's independent that exists within himself and needs nothing else. In fact, before the creation of the world, God existed. God is love. But because God wanted to share his love, he already had us in mind. And so he created the human race. We were uh, the outpouring of God's love that he wanted to share with us because that's who God is in his very essence. First John 4, 6, God is love. And because he wanted to share himself with his creation, who he had in mind. He had you in mind and me by name. And that's why he created us. The first thing that God created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. The Catholic Church has defined that verse, the great saints and popes and fathers of the church, have stated that in that instant, Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. At that moment, all the angels that exist today were created ex nihilo, out of nothing. God spoke them into existence. That was the first order of God's creation, the angels. What are angels? Angels are God's messengers. That's the definition of an angel, God's messengers. An angel doesn't have a body. An angel doesn't have a gender. You'll have some angels that, that portray a masculine personality. You'll have some angels that portray a feminine personality. They're genderless. Angels are pure intellect, highly, highly intelligent, and, hate, and angels also have a will. And so when God created the angels, the Catholic Church, right around the 6th century, uh, the Catholic Church says that God created the angels with a rank structure, like a military rank structure. So there are nine ranks of angels from one to nine. So you have inferior angels and you have superior angels. Angels have specific assignments. They are created mission specific. For example, there was an angel that God created that God said, you're going to be Jess Romero's guardian angel. That's your only job. So when God created this angel, mission specific, that's his only job is to journey with me, illuminate my thoughts uh, with uh, angelic knowledge, try to impel my intellect, illumine my intellect so I can move toward goodness, beauty, and truth, protect me from demons throughout the course of my life. And my angel, when I die, my soul enters before the presence of God, my guardian angel will be right there saying, Lord, I did my job, and God will say, okay, that's it. And then he's done. My guardian angel will never have another job again. They get one job, they're mission-specific, then that angel goes to heaven forever and enjoys the presence of God. So if the, my guardian 
an angel in yours, it's not going to get up back in the unemployment line. And God's going to say, okay, now you've got to guard this guy. And so the angels, the highest order of angels, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah the prophet describes the, the most powerful angels in heaven. They're called the seraphim. The word seraphim means the burning one. The seraphim are God's secret service. They are so powerful, they stand around the throne of God. And, and all they do, the Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 6, it says, And day and night the seraphim say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, the God of heaven and earth. And all they do, the seraphim, is they stand around the throne of God and praise God. So it's kind of, here's kind of an interesting, an interesting point. Sometimes the Protestants say, Hey, Catholics, why don't you guys pray the rosary? The rosary is repetitious prayer. God doesn't like repetitious prayer. Really? <laughs> then why doesn't he tell the angels, Hey, shut up. I've been hearing you guys for a billion years. <laughs> God, say something else. <laughs> no. The Bible says God is pleased. And all the angels do is repeat the same thing. They've been doing it for, I don't know how many years. Millions? I don't know. Thousands? I don't know. It also says in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 that the angels stand around the throne of God and say the same thing over and over. So God loves repetitious prayer when it comes from the heart, when it's heartfelt. It's like, for example, I'll give you an example. I've been married 20 to almost 40 years. If I tell Anita, like, flippantly, I love you, and she knows I just said it like, the, you know, quit bugging me, I love you. She knows that's not true. But when I tell her I love you from the heart, she loves it. Even after being married for 40 years, when I say, man, I love you, she's like, ooh. <laughs> Why? Because she knows when it comes from the heart versus she knows when I just said it reflexively, like, okay, don't bug me, I love you. And so God loves prayer from the heart. That's why the angels uh, say the same prayers forever and ever. Okay, so when God created the angels, God created this masterpiece of an angel called Lucifer. The word Lucifer means light bearer or son of the dawn. God's masterpiece of all the angels that he ever created was a being called Lucifer who was a seraphim, the highest order of angel in heaven, a seraphim. The seraphim are so powerful that Isaiah chapter 6 tells us that each seraphim has six wings. Powerful, six wings. Not two, not four, six. And day and night they say, and, and, and they're in the presence of God, and God is so holy that the Bible says that the seraphim, you know what they have to do in the presence of God? They have to cover their eyes with two wings. Oh, the six wings, two of them are used to cover their eyes because they're in God's presence, and God is too holy to look at. God dwells in an approachable light. And the seraphims are the ones that are closest to God in heaven. Lucifer was a seraphim. In fact, the tradition of the Jews, the rabbis, in the Talmud and the Targum, they say that Lucifer was the only seraphim that was ever created with 12 wings. The only angel that God ever created that has 12 wings, which means he's a super seraphim. He's a seraphim on steroids. God showed all the angels his plan for the future. We call this salvation history. God showed all the angels in an assembly what would happen with the human race in stages, in epochs. And so God showed all the angels the creation of Adam and Eve, the first man and first woman on the sixth day of creation. God showed the angels, uh, you know, uh, Noah and the flood, Abraham the great patriarch, uh, Moses and the great kingdom, uh, and the liberation from, the, from Egypt after 430 years of slavery, the way he used Moses as the great covenant mediator. God showed uh, the angels King David. Uh, he showed them history in stages, and God also showed him what we call as Catholics the incarnation, that God would become a man at a given point in time in the womb of a virgin called Mary, Mary of Jerusalem, God would become a man. God would take on a human body and be born in Bethlehem. And all the angels were now called to worship the God-man. 
when this was shown to the angels, Lucifer said, mm -mm, it ain't happening. Lucifer said in his mind, if God becomes a man, I'm not going to worship your God man. Why? Here's the demonic intellect at work. Because angels know that there's nobody like God. God is supernatural. Say supernatural. supernatural. Angels are preternatural. Say preternatural. Pre Humans are natural. Say natural. natural. Watch this. Supernatural God, preternatural angels, natural humans. Lucifer was an angel, preternatural power. He says that God who's supernatural, humbles himself, empties himself, and becomes a man, becomes merely natural. Lucifer understands angels were of a higher species than humans. Were of a superior intellect. We have more power. We have, we're of a higher order of beings. And so Lucifer says, if God becomes a man, I will not serve the God-man, Jesus Christ. The fathers of the church said, he told God, non servia! In Latin, that means, I will not serve. The implications is, if God, if you become a man in the person of Jesus Christ, I will not serve you. And by implication, also that means that I will not honor the woman who gives you a body. The Virgin Mary. And so a rebellion occurred in heaven. There was a, an angel of the lower rank. We call him St. Michael. Now, in the nine ranks of angels, the archangels are second, they're the second rung of the ladder. So think about an angel as a one striper, an archangel as a two striper. Okay? You go all the way to the top. The seraphim are nine stripers. The seraphim are the most powerful angel. Michael was an archangel, is an archangel. That's a two striper. Michael stepped up from amongst the assembly, and this was David and Goliath in heaven. Michael being David, Lucifer being Goliath. And Michael told him, You have, in, in, inside your parish, you actually have what Michael said, quis eat Deus in Latin. Who is like unto God? Michael tells Lucifer. In other words, quis eat Deus? Who is like unto God? The implication is, hey, Lucifer, you're big and strong and powerful and intelligent, but you're not God. And we're not going to worship. We're not going to follow you. You're not our leader. God's our leader. And so at that moment, the Bible says, and you can read this. I'm giving you the details, but the big picture is in Revelation chapter 12. It describes all of this. So right in Revelation chapter 12, if you want to read this at home tonight or during your break. But because what I'm saying, it gives you an overview, but I'm giving you the detail that comes from the church fathers in the mind of the Catholic Church. And so, a war broke out in heaven. Creation started with a war. The war was in heaven. What happened, the Catholic Church tells us that in that, in that instant... All the angels had to make a decision. No, just like we have to make a decision as, as Catholics every single day. Yeah, paragraph 393 of the Catechism. It says, it is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy of God that makes the angels' sin unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there's no repentance for men after death. So at that moment, God made all the angels, you've got to decide who you're going to follow. A third of the angels followed Lucifer. They told God, not said, yeah, we're not going to serve you. If you become a man, we're not going to serve you. This guy's our new leader. And so Lucifer, by default, became now the leader of the kingdom of darkness. We call Lucifer today the devil or Satan. Now, Michael, at that moment, Two-thirds of the angels also made an irrevocable decision, which means a decision that you can't take back. That's what that means. Michael and two-thirds of the angels made, it, made an irrevocable decision to follow God forever. So the battle lines were drawn in heaven. Two-thirds of the angels say, we're following God forever. A third of the angels say, we're done. We're following Lucifer. He's our new commander. At that moment, God made Michael the new commander in heaven. Michael 
has several titles in, in, in Christianity. One of them, he, he's called the general of the armies in heaven or the commander of the armies in heaven. The church gives him a military title. Michael, not by default, he became the leader. And God appointed him as the leader of all the angels. The Bible says a war broke out in heaven. And the good angels defeated the bad angels. And the Bible says that the bad angels, the fallen angels, we not call demons. The fallen angels, the Bible says, were thrown here to planet Earth. Guess what? They're here! You don't believe me? Just turn on the news. Yeah. Just turn on the news. You don't believe me? The demons roam the earth. The Bible actually says in 1 John 5.19, it says this, quote, quote, We are of God, and we the baptized of those of us that follow Jesus. We are of God, comma, and the whole world is under the power of the devil. The whole world. It doesn't say 90% of the world. It doesn't say 80% of the world, 50%. The Bible says the whole world is under the power of the devil. And so, at this moment, <clears throat> this, is what, this is what we call damnation history. How is it that the devil, the devil being the father, the prince, their master, how is it that he, and, and by the way, and the demons also have a rank structure. They also have a military rank structure. But here's a bit of good news in the midst of this, this, this salvation history story. The good news is that an angel is more powerful than a demon. I'm going to prove it to you. This church teaches, but I'll prove it to you from the Bible. All of us were given a guardian angel the moment that we were conceived in our, mom, in, in our mother's womb. At the moment of conception, the Catholic Church teaches officially at the Fourth Lateran Council that an angel was assigned to you by God at conception. And the angel will journey with you for the rest of your life until you stand before the presence of Jesus Christ at your particular judgment. Then the angel's job is over. You can, you can like this, wash his hands, and you can go to heaven forever. To prove to you and by the way, one of the particular jobs of an angel is to protect you from demons. That's one of his specific assignments. And it's in Psalm 91, verse 11 to 14, if you want to read what I'm saying. Psalm 91, verse 11 to 14. One of the, your guardian angel's specific jobs is to protect you from demons. Psalm 91, verse 11 to 14. To prove to you that your guardian angel is more powerful than a demon, it's simple. Of the nine ranks of angels, St. Michael was a, a two-striper, okay? Lucifer was what? A nine-striper. The Bible says Michael kicked Lucifer's butt. So what? A two-striper, David, beat up a nine-striper, Goliath in heaven. How? I'm going to tell you how. Because the demons, when they disconnected from God, they lost a lot of power. My laptop is running right now. It's not plugged in. It's running off the battery, so it's unplugged. But it would run longer and more efficient if I plugged it in somewhere. The angels, because they're plugged into God, even an inferior angel can defeat a superior demon because they're plugged into God. The demons lost much of their power when they disconnected from God. They're no longer connected to the power socket, which is God the Trinity. And so, although they kept some power because they're fallen angels, they lost much of their power. This is why an angel, even an inferior angel like a two-striper, Michael, can defeat a nine-striper, Lucifer, because Michael is plugged into God and Lucifer isn't. So that's a bit of good news. Amen? Amen. So just remember that. This is why it's important in the morning and the evening, start your day with the, with the uh, add that to your prayers is the guardian angel prayer. Angel of God, my guardian is here. Angel of Lord God, come and see me here. He ever lifts me at my side as a light, as a guard, as a rule, as a guide. Use that prayer in the morning. Use it in the evening. Maybe when you're in the airport, you're somewhere crowded, just call upon your guardian angel. Here's the theology of angels so you know. Angels go where they are called 
demons go where they're not resisted. Let me repeat that three times because this is going to help young spiritual worship. Angels go where they are called, or when they are called, and demons go where they're not resisted. Let me say that one more time. Angels go where they are called, and demons go where they're not resisted. So what does that mean? As soon as you pray, because prayer is conversation with God, says St. Clement of Alexandria in the 3rd century. Prayer is conversation with God. As soon as you pray, angels come down and surround you and take your prayers to heaven. That's another job of an angel. Not only are they your personal security guard, your personal bodyguard, but another assignment of your guardian angel is as soon as you pray, whatever you pray out of your mouth, you can say, Jesus, I trust in you, or grace before meals, or whatever you pray, spontaneous, mental, contemplative, your angel's job is to take your prayer like incense, Psalm 141, verse 1, and he takes it to the throne of God. That's what angels do. They carry our prayers to heaven. So, a lot of Catholics have unemployed angels. Because they don't pray. Your angel's standing there. Come on, Jesse, come on. Start. You know what the Bible calls prayer? In the book of Psalms, in two Psalms. I'll look them up right, right now. So I think if you want to. The Bible calls prayer arrows. So every time you pray, this is what you're doing. You're in archery. And pray, your prayers hurt demons. If you want to know the theology, you say, okay, so how do we hurt demons, Jesse? Do we get a baseball bat, an AR-15? Do I call LAPD? I mean, what do we do? What do we do? I get my, do I get my sword or nunchucks or brass knuckles? How do I hurt them? They don't have a body. You can't hurt. They don't have a body. It, they're pure intellect. Remember when we were kids, you heard a, a saying that went like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me or harm me. That's the exact opposite with demons. The only thing that hurts demons are the spoken word of God. That's it. Not political speech, not Shakespeare, not poetry. The only thing that hurts demons is the spoken word of God because they're pure intellect. If you want to know how intelligent a demon is or an angel, and this is why you never should talk to a demon, never talk to a demon or those that represent Satanists, Satan, like psychics, curanderas, uh, you know, uh, shamans, sorcerers, witches, wizards, uh, uh, Never, ever talk to somebody who represents Satan. And there's many people. Even an inferior angel or an inferior demon is about a thousand times uh, more intellectually astute and brighter than, than the person on planet Earth with the highest IQ. And if you want to see, it, it kind of gave you a little preview into the psychology of the intellect of a demon. Do yourself a favor and go watch the movie Nefarious. Nefarious is the best movie that's ever been made, ever, ever been made, depicting the psychological intelligence of a demon. Their pure intellect. Never talk to a demon. Not even a priest is allowed to talk to a demon. Because they'll, they'll, they'll make, they'll make mincemeat out of the priest. Now, Demons are afraid of priests because priests have what's called holy orders. And so they know, dang, this is, God, this is one of God's soldiers, one of God's generals. But if the demon knows that a priest is a liberal or a modernist, they're like, I need my body! <laughs> but initially, when a demon looks at the priest, he's afraid of him because of his rank. He's a general in the church militant, and he represents God's army. He's one of the delegated generals. But again, if he's a liberal or a modernist, 
And then the devil like, oh man, it's got to be funny. Let's shake hands. Dude, welcome to the team. Even a priest is not allowed to talk to a demon in an exorcism. The rite of exorcism was written in 1614 AD by St. Charles Borromeo. It has three chapters. Chapter 1 tells the priest how to do an exorcism and how to prepare for an exorcism. Chapter 2 is the actual prayers of exorcism. And chapter 3 is the long form St. Michael the Archangel prayer. In chapter 1, the church tells the priest, you can only ask a demon four questions and no more. Have no conversation. Don't ask any of his questions. Why? They're too smart for us. It would be like, uh, you know, somebody who graduated from an Ivy League college, valedictorian summa cum laude, uh, playing chess with a kindergarten kid. Nobody, no human being has any capacity to converse with a demon. They will shred you. They are the smartest, most rational beings in the universe that God ever created. And this is the wisdom of the Catholic Church. This is why the Catholic Church is always saying, do not talk to demons. Do not get involved in the occult. If you want to see a classic example of the way a human being got shredded, and this is a human being with a high intellect, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were created, and they had perfect, they had perfect integrity, which means that their intellect, their will, and their passions were perfectly ordered. Not like us. All of us as humans, we have an intellect, a will, and passions. It's called the three operations of the soul. But all of us, our, our intellect and our will and our passions are disordered because of original sin. That's when we go to confession. That's why we, you know, we're always praying and asking God for mercy and forgiveness because, because our integrity, intellect, will, and passions are disordered as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. All of us have original sin. We have concupiscence. We have this inclination to evil. Adam and Eve didn't have concupiscence. They were born without concupiscence. Adam and Eve had perfect control of their intellect, their will, and their passion. And yet, Eve began conversing with the devil who shape-shifted and took the form of a serpent. And even Eve, probably the most intelligent woman that's ever lived, because she was born with perfect integrity. She didn't have concupiscence like we do. Adam and Eve were born without concupiscence. But the devil deceived her, beguiled her, and she disobeyed God, committed original sin. Adam followed in the sin, and now the whole entire human race has been affected. Mom and dad's sin affect the rest of the family. It goes down the family line, especially dad's sin. So what happened with Adam and Eve? What was her... What should have happened? Number one, what was Eve's mistake? Curiosity. Women are too curious. Ooh, my comadre says that her friend, she could read the lines in your hands and she could tell you who you're gonna get married to. Ooh, my girlfriend says she's got a friend she could read these tarot cards and she could tell you how much money you're going to make. Women are too curious. Just like Eve. Curiosity was Eve's downfall. <clears throat> what was Adam's sin? Cowardice. Lack of courage. When the dragon was knocking at their front door at the Garden of Eden, Adam should have got, up, got off of his couch or wherever he was sitting on. As a man of the house, he should have answered the front door. Saw a big demon there, a serpent, dragon. He should have said, get out of my property. Get out. He says, or, or I'm going to kill you. And Adam should have been willing to die for his wife Eve, but he wasn't. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, was willing to die for us, is the church, is right, and he did. The first Adam was a coward. He should have got up and said, honey, 
back away. I'll handle this. Get back there, pray. And he should have confessed, said, get off my property. Get out right now. Be gone, Satan. But he didn't do that. And so he stood behind. He watched the conversation. He watched his wife get intellectually shredded by a demon because of her curiosity. Her sin, curiosity. His sin, cowardness. Nothing's changed. Eve's additional sin is the sin of usurpation. What does that mean? Usurpation means that Eve was acting like the man of the house. She was acting like, you know, the 1960s feminist. I am woman, watch me roar! Who sang that song? Who's that? How's it ready? I am woman, watch me roar! That's the sin of usurpation. And this is why there's a lot of marriages that have a lot of problems. I'm going to give you something that's going to help your marriages. And if you follow this, you're going to bring a lot of peace and harmony into your marriage. What I'm going to say is gold. That's my next book, by the way. It's going to be called Stay in Your Lane. Which men have to know their role. What is a man's role? Right here. St. Joseph. St. Joseph, when you study his life, he spoke nothing in the New Testament that's recorded. He was a man of action. No words, action. What do we see from the New Testament on the life of St. Joseph? He led the Holy Family. Led, leader, leader. He protected the Holy Family. And he provided for the Holy Family. That's the essence of manhood. Duty is the essence of manhood. To lead your family, ultimately from this life to heaven. To protect your family physically and spiritually and to provide for your family physically and spiritually. That's the goal of a man. That's the essence of manhood. You want to look at a true man? That's the quintessential man. Most men, unfortunately, they look at true men, they go, ooh, look at those athletes and the NBA, the NFL, ooh, look at those UFC fighters, ooh, look at Chapo Guzman, ooh, look at you have Most men have the wrong example of manhood. Look no further. What's the essence of Catholic femininity? And this is difficult, I know it is, because everything in our culture in America tells women, you gotta be a feminist, you gotta be a feminist. And there are demons that are working on every single women, woman on planet Earth. They are demons that are pushing radical feminism, projecting their thoughts into your minds through temptation every day. There are, there, here are three big demons that work on women, and they've been doing it since the beginning of time. The demon of Jezebel, that's the demon that teaches women, you wear the pants. Tell your husband to sit down and shut up on the couch, okay? You run this household. He's a big buffoon. He's a bozo, okay? You, you call the shots of the family. That's the spirit of Jezebel. Many women have that spirit. Hillary Clinton, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, the list goes on. There's another evil spirit that works on women called the spirit of Lilith. These are demons, by the way, who we reject, rebuke, and renounce in Jesus' name. Go to the foot of the cross, you evil spirits, that Jesus Christ may do with you as he wills. Mother Mary, crush the head of these infernal spirits under your immaculate feet. St. Joseph, terror, demons, pray for us and protect us here in that. 
Lilith is another demon that works on women. That's the demon of usurpation, the demon of rebellion. These are specific demons that go after women. The third demon that goes after women is called Astaroth. Astaroth. That's a demon with a female personality of sexual perversion. The devil has, these are, these are known as the generals of Satan. These are the upper echelon of Satan. And all of them have foot soldiers under them. And so what's the essence of femininity? The essence of femininity is right here. The Blessed Virgin Mary. When you study the Blessed Virgin Mary, what do we see in her life? There's three things that we see in her life, right from the New Testament. We see that she was open to receive from God. Be it done unto me according to thy word. So she was receptive to God. Receptive to the voice of God, to the promptings of God. And by extension, since she received the voice of God and the instruction of God and followed the voice of God, she also received her husband, St. Joseph. Because God gave St. Joseph to her as a guardian of the Holy Family. And so she received him as well. Didn't question God. Then say, I don't want to get married or he's too old or none of that stuff. Yes, Lord. What else do we see about the life of the Blessed Virgin Mary? That's true femininity. She surrendered to God. Receive and surrender. Her whole life was one of surrendering to God. And by extension, she also surrendered her will to the patriarchy of St. Joseph. Here's something interesting. Mary and Jesus are sinless. Think about that. Never committed sin, and both of them were born without original sin. Doesn't say that about St. Joseph. Although, you know, obviously... And next to the Blessed Virgin Mary, is probably the most, uh, the greatest saint in heaven. But theologically speaking, Joseph was not born without original sin. And, and Joseph would have had concupiscence like you and I. What's that? This inclination to sin. St. Joseph lived in a house with two perfect people. Perfect! Here's what's interesting Mary, perfect. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee, immaculately conceived, surrendered to his authority. Guess who led the family in prayer? The Holy Family, you got God there, you got the perfect human being, Mary, perfect! Guess who led the family in prayer? The only non perfect one. The one that's not full of grace, the one that's not immaculately conceived. He takes prayer time. Jesus was God, and Mary, the most perfect creature, said, yes, Joseph. Who led grace before meals? Joseph. Who read the Bible to Jesus and Mary? Joseph. Who did night prayers for the family and led them? Joseph. Who laid hands on Jesus and prayed over him? Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 and 26. May the Lord be with you. And may the Lord shine his face upon you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord be gracious to you and kind to you and give you his peace. Who laid hands on Jesus? Who laid hands and prayed over Mary? This is mind blowing. This is the order of creation that God has established and America and the woke left and Satan is trying to destroy it. The family, marriage, patriarchy. The devil hates that. 
Because the devil knows that social and moral order is brought into society, into a country, and into a family through patriarchy. Destroy patriarchy, you destroy families. Destroy families, you destroy Western civilization. Who gave us Western civilization? Everything great about Western civilization was given to us by Roman Catholic Christianity. The Catholic Church has been around for 2,000 years, took the great thinkers from Athens, Greece, the great orators and philosophers from Athens. The Catholic Church took the great wise men, the sages and the prophets from the Jews, the Old Testament. And the Catholic Church took the structure and the order from Rome. The Catholic Church took Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome and put them together into what we call Western civilization. Everything good about the world comes from the Catholic Church who took the great cities, the, the intellectual giants from Athens, Jerusalem, and Rome and put them together. And guess who's trying to destroy it right now? Communism. Communism. We were warned that communism would be the final battle by Our Lady of Fatima that's here. What else do we know about the Blessed Virgin Mary? She surrendered, she received, and she trusted. Receive, surrenders, and trust to God and to her husband. I'll say it again. And this is all the Bible, by the way. Mary receives, surrenders, and trusts God and her husband. Because God gave her a husband. And she understood. In the Old Testament, guess who was the priest of the house? The man. Amen. This is why the devil wants to go after men specifically. Specifically go after men. Because if he could wipe out a guy, he could wipe out the whole family. Because you take the priest out of the home. Okay, I'm going to teach you ladies how to do something because some of you are saying, I don't want to pray for my husband. I want to be, I want to be on fire for the Lord. Here's what you're going to do. Okay? Starting tonight, I want you starting tonight, and then I'll, I'll teach the husbands as well. How does a woman pray for her husband? Pope Pius XII says that the man is the head of the home, Ephesians 5.22, and the woman is the heart of the home. That's, she's the heart of the home. The woman is the heart of the home, the man is the head of the home. You need both in a family. You need head and heart. If you have two heads, that's called homosexuality. If you have two hearts, that's called lesbianism. That's disorder. You want order in your family? Because God is a God of order, not of disorder. We need a head and we need a heart. The way a woman should pray for her husband. Because based on 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I believe it's verse 4. In the sacrament of marriage, the husband has rights over his wife's body. And the wife has rights over her husband's body. That's right in the Bible. Don't argue with me. That's right in the Bible. And so, a husband and a wife have the power to pray for each other with a special potency because of the sacrament of marriage. Because you have rights over each other's body, you have special power to pray for each other. So, I want to pray over my wife. I think that, can you come over here, babe? Just, I want to just, please, can I embarrass you? And then, and then can you pray, pray for me? Is my wife out there? She's not, eh, 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 come on, babe. I just, we just gotta, I just want to show them so they don't forget this. I think if we, if we show them, they won't forget. Okay. Because I'm the man, I can put my hand on my wife's head because I'm the priest of the house. And that's a priestly position. And I have rights over her body based on the sacrament of marriage. Because she's my spouse, she has rights over my body. But she knows she's a hormone, so she puts her hand on my heart when she prays over me. 
because she owns my heart. And she's the one that has custody over my heart because she's the heart of the family. And so we're going to make it real simple so you don't forget. I'm going to make it very simple. Just think about the two words. BP, bless, protect, bless, protect, BP, 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 very simple. So the way I pray for my wife is I say, I bless you, Anita, and may God protect you in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. BP, bless, protect. When she prays for me, she's not the patriarch of the home. She's the matriarch. But she, she has rights over my body. So she has the power to bless me. Because of the sacraments of marriage, she owns my body. First Corinthians chapter seven. So she prays for me this way. May the Lord bless and protect my husband in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice she put her hand on my heart because that's what a woman is called the heart of the home. She's a part of the home, and so she's called to protect the husband's heart. The man is the head of the home. And so if you notice there was a difference the way we prayed, and you may see the cast a nuance. If you notice, when I prayed for Anita, I said, I could be either or, imprecatory or deprecatory. I could say, I bless you and protect me. I bless you and Lord protect the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I can use the word I since I'm the priest of the home. Notice when Anita prayed for me, she didn't say I. She said, may the Lord. Because to say I is a priestly prayer. And since you know, she knows she's not the priest of the home, notice what she said. This is what the Old Testament teaches when lay people pray for each other. She said, may the Lord. So she's calling on God to bless and protect. BP. May the Lord bless and protect in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You should be doing that every night to each other. For the rest of your life, the men, I don't care, if your wife may be asleep, put your hand over red. BP, I bless you, and may the Lord protect you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Every night for the rest of your life. If you start doing that, especially to your husband, he just, and just tell your husband, he'll say, I want to pray for you. Ah, I want to see you have a seat. I don't want to pray for you. Ah, my wife's baseball. Okay, see me in 10 seconds. And then, you know, just be kind, put your hand in his heart. May the Lord bless and protect you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make a little cross in his heart. You start doing that, your husband is going to start receiving the grace of God, the grace of conversion. That's going to touch him so deep because you have rights to his body. So you have the power of calling God's blessing upon your husband. And you also have the power to bind demons from your husband and husband to the wife. Let me, uh, I've got five more minutes. Where's my timekeeper? Five more minutes, right? Okay. Um, so as Catholics, this is, this is our paradigm. Joseph, lead, protect, provide. Blessed Mother, receive, surrender, and trust. If you bring those two together, you're going to have a holy family. You know why a lot of families are in shambles? Because people don't know how to stay in their lane. Men are very effeminate. I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to church. You know, I'm going to tell you the hardest thing to do is pray. Real men pray. It's easy to lift weights. It's easy to punch a bag. It's easy to go run. It's easy to go do sports. It's easy. That's easy. I've been doing that all my life. It's easy. You know what's hard? Discipline your mind and your body and say, okay, I'm going to do my morning prayers. I'm going to do my morning rosary. That takes guts. That, that takes effort. It's easy to do sports. I know. I thought for 10 years in the ring, that was easy to run five miles a day. It was easy to work out in the gym two hours a day and spar. It was easy. Praying is hard. This is why guys went away from it. But this is our weapon. The Bible calls prayers arrows. Let me give you in these, the theology of how this works so you understand the power of prayer. Okay. This is the Catholic teaching on prayer. 
when you pray, prayer's got to come from the heart. St. Teresa of those loud. Any prayer to be meritorious has to come from your heart. When the prayer leaves your heart, it either comes out of your mouth or your mind. Contemplative, meditative prayer, vocal prayer, spontaneous prayer. Your angel takes your prayer, it comes out like incense, and it carries that prayer to heaven. It places it before the throne of God. What's the goal of prayer? Not only is it conversation with God, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta says the goal of prayer is to be possessed by Jesus Christ. Think about that. Powerful words. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. The goal of prayer is to be possessed by Jesus Christ. Prayer has an offensive nature to it. So when you pray, your prayers rise up in the air, in the heavenly places, or what we call the cosmos. The, the, the New Testament word, the cosmos means the world, heavenly places. Your, your prayer rises up into the cosmos. Who is in the cosmos? Angels and demons. Your prayers injure and drive demons back. Much like a dolphin in the ocean, they project through their brain what's called sonar. This uh, sonar through, through the waters which repels sharks. Dolphins do this mentally through their brain. They project sonar and it pushes, it repels sharks. This is the theology of prayer. We as Catholics project our prayers into the cosmos because that's what prayer does. It's projected and angels carry it to heaven. Who are the sharks in the heavenly places? Demons. Your prayers push demons back. You don't believe me? Read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. When Jesus Christ was confronted by Satan, did he talk politics with them? No. Did he talk poetry with them? No. What did Jesus Christ do? He quoted the Bible. He prayed. The devil says, hey, why don't you do this? And Jesus would come back and quote the Bible. He says, the Lord said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus quotes back the word of God to the devil. And what does it say in verse 11? It says, and then Jesus says in verse 10, be gone, Satan. Then the Bible says, and Satan left him, and the angels came and ministered to them. That story tells you exactly what prayer does. Prayer drives demons away. It can't be killed. They're indestructible like angels. They can never die. They will be consigned to hell one day, but they can never die. So your prayers, just like in Matthew chapter 4, verse 11, it hurts them and it drives them back and they'll leave you alone. And they'll rather, they'll rather harass somebody that doesn't pray. See, because we're all temples of the Holy Spirit. Demons are just studying, 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 studying. I'll leave him alone. He's always praying. Uh, I'll leave her alone. She's always praying. Ah, this guy doesn't pray. I like this guy. And they're all over you. Prayer is an offensive weapon. That's all we have. I think... That's a wrap, right? That's a wrap. Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's pray. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. Amen. Glory to thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy body, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and in the hour of Virgin most powerful, Saint Joseph, care of demons. All you holy angels and saints of God. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. 1973, Roe versus Wade passed. Seven out of two judges said yes, and they were all men. And what does that tell you? A society that has men that don't pray, right? Since then, many babies have been aborted. Right here locally, we have a, just across the school, we have a Planned Parenthood, and a couple of miles away, we have an FPA. And they're slaughtering babies every day. Thanks be to God, 
Holy Innocence is a safe haven. They have this ministry called the Holy Innocence Expectant Mothers Outreach. And it started in 2008. Since then, they've saved 1,554 babies from abortion. This year, this year in 2023, thanks be to God, 16 babies have been saved from abortion. Thanks be to God. We're holding a raffle and benefit to that ministry because not only do they save the babies, but after the baby is born, they supply them with pampers. They supply them with material that the mom needs, clothes, baby diapers, wipes, anything. So we have um, a miraculous medal. We also have a St. Benedict medal, and we have a shield of St. Michael the Archangel, all made out of wood. We're going to raffle these. The raffles are $5 each, and you can get them in that over there where we are at on our table. And this is all going to go to them to benefit the babies, to help them, help those mothers in need. Um, also, another announcement. Somebody left their phone in the back. So go to the table in the back. Check your purses or pockets. If you, have, if you don't have your phone, we have it over there. In the ladies' room. In the ladies' room. Thank you, Chuck. Father Robert is going to be... Um, also confessing at 11 a.m. So there's going to be confessions during from 11 a.m. until lunch is over. So don't miss that opportunity.